Hello everybody, this is Mr. Z, and this is Callie, if you hear any squeaking throughout the video. Today we're going to cover the writing and language, or the grammar portion, of practice test 10. Hope everybody's doing alright. This is collegeboard.org. We're going to scroll down to SAT and bring up the practice tests. If you remember how to get there, that's great, but if not, go down here, practice, go down to practice tests for the official practice tests. And we're going to look at practice test 10, click the see all, and this top link brings you right to it. And we're going to specifically be looking at page 22, the second test, the writing and language test. Give yourself 35 minutes to answer these 44 questions. Number one is about this sentence here. Among other problems, Hersey noted, the reading material available to grade schoolers had a hard time competing with television, radio, and other media for children's attention. And the underlined portion is here, this word and. So this is a parallel structure question. There's three possible ways to maintain parallel structure here. I'm using C and W for the words competing and with. So I could, you could say competing with TV, competing with radio, and competing with other media. All three get the verb and the preposition. That works. You could say competing at the start and then with TV, with radio, and with other media. So the preposition goes with all three objects. And probably the best way to do this is to have the verb and the preposition at the beginning and then just list your objects, TV, radio, and other media. If you try to only have the preposition with two of these, then that breaks parallelism. And that's what's going on here for both B and D. We're breaking parallel structure. Choice C is also incorrect because also is redundant. When you're giving a list of things and the final one is started with and, you don't need to say also. A, no change, was the best choice. Number two reads, one solution he proposed was to make children's books more interesting. That's where they're like. And then a bunch of different words after that. And we're trying to figure out which choice best accomplishes the goal supporting the topic of the passage. So the topic actually is right here in the first sentence, or it's often here in the beginning. It's that children were disengaged from learning how to read. So we're trying to interest children in books again. And specifically, we're talking about how a cat in the hat accomplished this. So what do you think shows up in A Cat in a Hat? Do we have a sense of wholeness or learning starting with failure or journalism allowing its readers to witness history? Or do you think it's drawings like those of the wonderfully imaginative geniuses among children's illustrators? D is the best choice. It fits with the thesis and with the cat in the hat idea. Number three is in this sentence. The story of the cat in the hat's publication began when William Spaulding, the director of the education division at the publishing company Houghton Milton, read Hersey's article and had an idea. The part we're concerned about I put in blue brackets. And the question is, is this essential information? Does it narrow down my subject, William Spaulding, any further, or is it just extra non-essential information about him? Because it's non-essential, I could set apart this information with a series of commas, as written, in fact, no change is going to be the answer. Or I could use two dashes or two parentheses. And since there's this comma at the end, we have to put a comma at the beginning. That's why no change is the best answer. How can we effectively combine these two sentences? Spalding agreed that there was a need for appealing books for beginning readers. He thought he knew who should write one. So let's look at our answer choices and see what we can cross off. C has a semicolon and a conjunction. We're pretty much never going to see that unless we're separating items in a punctuated list. So we know that that's wrong. If you're going to use a dash to join together two independent clauses, like here in B, the second one should explain the first. And that's not really the case here. Not the best choice. Between A and D, remember that shorter is better. We don't really need to say meanwhile. A is the best choice. For number five, it says, which choice best supports the information that follows? So we want to back up the idea that Geisel was an experienced writer and illustrator. How could we best support that? So is knowing a guy for years? Well, maybe that, that helps a little bit. That he's acquired a reputation for perfectionism and setting high standards? Well, that's pretty good. But doesn't show anything about experience, necessarily. 
Been interested in politics? Irrelevant completely. D. Published nine children's books and been nominated for Caldecott Medal three times. Well, those are some pretty good criteria or qualifications in terms of being an experienced writer and illustrator. D is the best choice here. For number six, we're trying to choose the correct transition. And if we look at the previous sentence, that Geisel was an experienced writer and illustrator and all these things about his awards. And the next one is that this new project presented him with an obstacle. So he's experienced, he's a great writer, but this new project was hard. Are they about the same idea? Are they showing cause and effect? Or is there a contradiction here? Or a contrast? And I would say there's a contrast. So we can rule out B and C, and however is the only one really that shows a contrast. It's the best choice. Number seven is about preventing a dangling modifier. We have this opening phrase, on the verge of giving up, and there's no subject there. So whatever comes right after the comma, the very first noun, has to make sense with this modifier. Was the story on the verge of giving up? Well, that doesn't make sense. Was an image on the verge of giving up? Was the story on the verge of giving up? Or was Geisel on the verge of giving up? So not even reading the rest, just looking at that opening phrase and which one could possibly work, C is the best answer. It's the only one that prevents a dangling modifier. Number eight, at the end of a duration, nine months long, duration and long, lots of repetitive words there, okay? After 36 weeks or nine months, again, there's some re redundancy or repetition there. After a length of nine months had elapsed, okay, so a lot of redundancy. Shorter is better. If you're not adding any extra information, the shortest answer is going to be the best throughout the SAT on the writing and language portion. D is the best answer. For number nine, our subject here is children. That's our subject. And then we have this helping verb, were. And then our verb is entertained and captivated. So we actually have a compound predicate here. Children were entertained and captivated. We don't need is there. It doesn't really make sense. You could say and were, were entertained and were captivated, but is should be taken out. The reason why I wouldn't use was is because children is plural, but we can also just refer back to the helping verb from the previous one. Were and were. So these are wrong. Is doesn't make any sense. It's singular also. D is the best Number 10, in the years that followed. Well, that's a fragment. If you're looking for a subject and a verb, we don't have it. So any of these choices that involve ending the sentence, like a period or a semicolon, are definitely wrong. And a dash similarly cannot be used to start a, or rather to separate a phrase from a independent clause. C is the only one that correctly uses a comma to set off this introductory phrase. For 11, the writer wants a conclusion that restates the main themes of the passage. So you had to read the whole thing and actually think about it, rather than just only looking at the underlined portions. But here's a clue. I go back to the title, How a Cat in a Hat Changed Children's Education. And I go back to my thesis, this idea that children were disengaged. So if we talk about limited vocabulary and appealing word choices, that might have helped, but that's not really the main theme. Impressive worldwide sales, again, not the main theme. Important role in the history of illustration, close, but not really. C is the best choice. We're talking about engaging children in learning how to read. Brought it back to the theme that was introduced in the opening paragraph. So let's read this opening paragraph from the title and see if we can figure out the main themes of this passage. Keep student volunteering voluntary. So a growing number of schools are requiring students to do community service to graduate. But critics say that it misses the point of the act. So I think they're pretty much arguing against this trend and saying that any volunteer work should be voluntary. Number 12 is a parallel structure question. We have three items joined in a series here. The first one, helping at a local animal shelter. The third one, working at a healthcare facility. And we have to pick out which one should be the second. And if I just look at the very first word, helping, working, picking, D. 
13, we want to contrast this idea that making volunteerism compulsory misses the point of the act. So we want to choose to emphasize that it's volunteer and not compulsory. The only one that does that is no change by its very definition, because that's emphasizing volunteer work and how it's done willingly. The other three choices here, they emphasize other things like whatever the work is, about the students, or the communities. A is the only one that emphasizes that it's voluntary, to show that contrast. 14 is an apostrophe question. So we use apostrophes with nouns to show ownership or possession. Here, school officials, do they own anything here? School officials are taking away, no they don't. So this apostrophe needs to go. And if you look at the answer choices, B, C, and D, and none of them have it. So that just rules out A. The only difference between the other choices, we have no apostrophe, like this. We have an apostrophe before the S or after the S. So looking elsewhere and considering what we're talking about in the sentence, is students singular or plural? Are we taking away one student's choice or all students' choice choices? And because it's plural, having the apostrophe after the S is the correct choice. That's why D is the best answer. Plural possessive. 15 is a redundancy question. Proponents of compulsory volunteering, this word proponents already means people that are in favor of it. So if we then add who are in favor of it or advocating it or and its advocates, all of those are redundant. They mean the same thing as proponents. That's why C is the best choice. It's the only one that doesn't repeat that idea twice. So 16, we're looking for a supporting example that's similar to the other examples already in the sentence. So students who volunteer report three things. Number one, increased self-esteem. Number two, better relationship building skills. These are all positive so far. And increasingly busy schedules. Well, that's a negative, so I'm going to rule that one out. A closer connection with their community. That makes sense. Less time spent engaging in social activities. That's possibly a negative. And little increase in academic achievement. That's also a negative. So we wanted the only one that was positive, like the other two. B was the answer. For 17, we have to remember that, generally speaking, effect with an A is a verb, and effect with an E is a noun. And here we see to, volunteer, and effect. So we want the verb form to match with volunteer. And we don't need ing or anything else like that because it sh we should match it up with volunteer as closely as possible. That's why B is the best choice. For 18, we're trying to be precise with the word that's describing this volunteering. Mandatory is the best answer here. If you chose coercive, then somebody's like forcing you to do it with some sort of threat, perhaps, similar with that one. And imperative means because it's really important or necessary. For school situation, mandatory is the best choice. In 19, we should recognize that we're joining together two complete sentences. Lots of clauses in the first one, especially. So this comma alone after school is not going to be enough. No change is definitely wrong. Then it comes down to the commas. To put a comma here after the subject, between the subject and the verb, is not a good idea and not what we want to do incorrect. Same thing going on in B. A comma between the subject and the verb is not ideal. So D is the best choice because the semicolon correctly joins together two sentences and we don't have an unnecessary comma. In number 20, this word than, T-H-A-N, is extremely important because it shows we're making a comparison between two things. So is this a logical comparison? As written, we're comparing they, the students, to the service hours. The students did more work than the service hours. Well, that doesn't make any sense. So A is definitely wrong. And C makes the same mistake. We're comparing students to hours. And if you look at D, it changes what's going on. Because here we're comparing uh, students that did a lot of volunteer work in the 12th grade, or less work, rather, to students that weren't required to at all. So that one's entirely different. B is the best choice. We are logically comparing students to students, and we're not changing the meaning. For 21, we're setting up the point that's made in the next sentence. So the point in the next sentence is that when schools just tell students about opportunities, more students volunteer on their own free will. So which one sets up that point? Talking about not all students equally well-suited doesn't really work. 
encouraging them to spend time in athletics, doesn't set up that point at all. So we're down to C or D. And while D is about uh, influencing students, this one is saying that we should recognize our limits rather than how we can help, which C is the best choice. And for 22, you had to actually read the whole passage and think about it and understand it. So what's the main claim? Let's go back to the beginning. Keep students volunteering, voluntary. Requiring students to complete it. Critics say that making it misses the point. So yes, we're talking about volunteering, but how we go about it. Making it mandatory or just encouraging it. So A doesn't fit. Schools can do their part, but that doesn't mean, they don't even mention mandatory at all. C doesn't address the main point. That would be like a supporting argument for one of the sides. D, that's a sub point. B is the best choice. Schools that get rid of mandatory will have more engaged and enthusiastic volunteers. If you couldn't tell, Amelia's awake, so to be continued. So let's see if we can figure out passage three of four is about marsupials lend a hand to science. And they define marsupials here, mammals that carry young in their pouch. And their curiosity, in most other mammals, certain things happen. Scientists believe that this structure, some sort of structure that marsupials have, allows them to complete complex tasks. However, that's an important word, a recent finding of handedness in marsupials suggests that it's some other trait, other than the presence of a corpus callosum, links as handedness, bipedalism. So it seems like marsupials lend a hand to science because they help figure out what causes handedness, which is pretty much whether you're left-handed. 23 is one of those questions where if you read them, the answer choices out loud, you could possibly figure it out. For example, scientists are long believing. Scientists will long be believing. Scientists have long believed. Scientists long believe. I mean, C just sounds the best out of those choices. To me, anyway. It turns out the reason for that is because this is in the present perfect tense. When we say have, which agrees with the plural scientists, long believed, we're saying we started something in the past and it continues to the present, which is what's true. Marsupials are a curiosity among biologists. They have been and they still are. And this is kind of set up later by when we say, however, recently we've changed our mind. For 24, we see a definition of this word handedness, the tendency to consistently prefer one hand over the other, or in favor of the use of one hand over the other, or one hand over the other that could be chosen. All of those are kind of the same, and shorter is better. D is different, one hand on a regular basis. doesn't really emphasize that it's one hand over the other. That's why A is the best choice. It's the shortest, and it doesn't change the for 25, it turns out, other than is functionally like a preposition. So we have a, a series of prepositional phrases here, rather than non-essential information. So no commas or any punctuation are necessary at all. 25 should just be A, no change. So for 26, if we recognize that a trait is the subject, and links, or whatever we're replacing links with, is the verb, and then we see as is another preposition. So this is the verb, and this is a preposition. Which one is just standard idiomatic English? Does a trait link as handedness? Does a trait correlate with handedness? Does a trait correlate from handedness? Or does a trait link on handedness? And it turns out B correlates with is the best. 27 refers to the graph. So let's read what's written. Negative scores indicated a left forelimb preference and positive scores indicated a right forelimb preference. Well, that seems to be backwards, because here are the negative scores, and they're linked with right, not left. So I think we can rule out A and B. Those all say that negative means left forelimb preference. And C is also has an error. Positive scores indicate a lack of preference, which is not true. We see that the positive scores here have a left forelimb presence. That's D, the correct association with left. 28 has a list of four different bipedal marsupials, such as eastern gray kangaroos, red-necked wallabies, red kangaroos, and brush-tailed betongs. So generally speaking, the Oxford comma goes here before the word and when you're listing items in a series. So the problem is that it's after. 
and we would not use a semicolon here for the last item, nor would we use a dash and a comma. That one's just B. 29, we go back to the graph. We're looking at all of the bipedal marsupials as we celebrate feeding the cat goldfish and slam around some little people. Good job, Amelia. But anyway, uh, all bipedal marsupials, do they have an index value that's less than 0.2? And that one's just not true. There's 0.2, they're not less than it. Choice B, are they greater than 0.6? Well, here's 0.6. Nope, they're not above that. Are they between 0.4 and 0.6? Well, yeah, that's true. And is the mean head in this index value 0? Well, that's not true either. So C was the best. So for the next one, we have to go back to the previous paragraph because it's talking about a transition. So in this paragraph, we're talking about bipedal marsupials, which means those that have two legs. And in this next paragraph, we're talking about quadrupedal. Quadrupedal? I don't know. Four legs. Whatever. And we want to emphasize the contrast. So C is the best choice because we're showing how these are different. By the way, the robot voice suggests quadrupedal is the correct way to pronounce that word. So for 31, main claim. Let's go back to the beginning. The main claim is down here at the bottom. A recent finding of handedness in marsupials suggests that it's bipedalism, or having two feet, is what correlates with handedness. And B is the closest one to that statement, and the correct For 32, we have this relative pronoun that replaces the word tasks. So who or whom don't really make sense, because those would replace people. Instead, we want a relative pronoun that replaces tasks. So whom and whose are ruled out, and then the word what is not a relative pronoun. B is the best choice. So 33 is about the conclusion of the passage. It's supposed to recall a topic from the first paragraph, and some of these were never even mentioned in the first paragraph, so those are some rule outs. But if you go back to this monstrosity of a first paragraph, we keep talking about the corpus callosum and what it does and how it connects the two hemispheres of the brain and that it allows communication between the hemispheres. And marsupials don't have this, but they still have handedness. So how does their brain, how do their brain hemispheres talk to each other? And that's the right answer. A, no change. Referring back to that absence of a corpus callosum and how the hemispheres of the, of the marsupial brain might communicate. And an update, it's pronounced corpus callosum if you wanted to pronounce it correctly. 34 starts off with a transition question, and everything before the transition talks about how companies do provide tuition assistance to employees pursuing different types of degrees, and everything after talks about how more companies should do this because it helps and improves their business. C is the best choice because it's saying 54 and 50% are high, but mo even more than that should because of the benefits. For 35, if we go back to the title, we're trying to figure out benefits that help the employers. So B doesn't really work. Neither does C. Those are about rising tuition costs in the economy. It's either A or D. While A would indirectly benefit employers, that's not what we're actually talking about. Attracting and retaining employees would more directly benefit the employers. That's the main idea. So breaking down 36, employers offer opportunities to their workers. We have an indirect object here and a direct object. The opportunities don't belong to the workers, so there's no need to have an apostrophe there, which rules out A and D. And the op nothing belongs to the opportunities either. We see prepositional phrases after that, so C is the best choice. For 37, I would encourage you to cons consider this part as if it wasn't even there. That's an A positive describing John Fox. And because it's surrounded by commas, it's not essential. So we don't need the who or the and he. And if we use stressing as our main verb, we'd have a fragment. B is the best choice. John Fox stressed the importance of drawing skilled employees to Fiat Chrysler's car. For 38, we're combining sentences again. And it's key to note that retain employees and retaining employees is rather redundant. We don't need to say both of these. So I would argue that A and B, repeating that word retain, can be ruled out based on redundancy. The other two, C and D, 
take the second sentence and make it into a dependent clause rather than an independent clause because they start with relative pronouns like which or that. And we don't use a semicolon to join them. For 39, it's important to remember that when we have an independent clause followed by a dependent clause, in the vast majority of cases, there's no punctuation. But when the dependent clause comes first, there's a comma between the two. So here, as written, everything underlined in red would be a fragment. It's a dependent clause all by itself, and we have to attach it to that main clause. And when the dependent clause comes second, we tend to use no punctuation at all. That's why C is the best answer. Number 40 involves this non-essential information about Valerie Lincoln, an employee at the aerospace company United Technologies Corporation, UTC. Now, it's non-essential, so we would surround it by comma, comma, dash, dash, or parenthesis, parenthesis. We didn't get to pick the one in front. That was a comma, which means we have to put a comma there. That's why D is the best choice. 41 is about precise word choice. We're talking about... In eight years at UTC, what Lincoln did, Lincoln earned these degrees and advanced from one position to another, allowing the company to retain an employee that had a deep knowledge of the industry and years of valuable experience. So deep probably fits better than large or spacious, though they all kind of mean the same thing. Hidden wouldn't really be appropriate here. That's, they've, they've known this employee since the beginning. It's no, there's no secret. So I'm going to go with A. 42 is a redundancy problem, and each choice is kind of redundant in a different way. Here we see minimizing and keeping down. And the next one we see employees' coursework and then employees' coursework. And then we see being effective and have succeeded. The only one lacking redundancy is choice D. I think 43 is a great one for the strategy of just trying to read this out loud and does it sound right. Classes are likely to divert employees' time and energy from their jobs. Classes are likely diverted employees' time and energy from their jobs. Class, classes are likely in diverting employees' time and energy from their jobs. Classes are likely diversions for employees' times and en time and energy from their jobs. So that told me that A sounds best. And yet, yeah, an infinitive works great here, to divert, where the others, not so much. So 44 is tough. To make the passage most logical, we're inserting this sentence somewhere at the end of one of the paragraphs, and which one would it fit with best? So rather than go back to all four, we just look at that word still, and just kind of a contrast word. So we're looking for one of the paragraphs that ends with a statement about how maybe the reimbursement programs aren't a good idea, such as paragraph four. Tuition reimbursement may not be appropriate in all cases. Still, they should give serious thought to doing it. Paragraph 4 is correct.